Hello and welcome to this video on business analyst interview questions by IntelliPad. Today in this particular video we will look into some of the popular business analyst interview questions that we gathered from recruiting teams at different MNCs and startups. So make sure you stay tuned with us till the end. But before we do that make sure you enable both the subscribe button and bell icon for IntelliPad YouTube channel so that you won't miss any updates coming from our end. Okay guys now let's start this video with some SQL queries first. So our first question is how would you retrieve unique values from a column using SQL? Okay so to get unique values from a column in SQL we would use distinct keyword. For example as you can see here the query select distinct column name from table name. So in this SQL query the distinct keyword is used in a select statement to retrieve unique values from a specific column and when it applied to a column it filters out duplicate values and presenting only distinct values in the result set. So the query select distinct column name from table name retrieves and displays unique values from the specified column in the given table. Now moving on to next question which says what is the difference between inner join and outer join in SQL? An inner join in SQL basically retrieves matching rows from both tables based on a specific condition and it only includes the rows that have matching values in both the tables. On the other hand, an outer join in SQL retrieves matching and unmatched rows from one or both tables and it includes all the rows from one table and the matching rows from the other table. And if there is a no match, null values are displayed for columns from the table with no matching row. Now coming to the third question which says can you describe the process of group by and having clauses in SQL. So talking about the purpose of the group by clause it is basically used to group rows based on the values in one or more columns and it is typically used with aggregate functions like count, sum, average and etc. On the other hand the purpose of having clause is it is used to filter the results of a group by clause based on a specified condition and it is generally applied after the group by clause and before the order by clause. Now let us see our fourth question. So what are SQL views and how are they used? So a view in SQL is basically a virtual table based on the result of a select query and it does not store the data itself but provides a way to represent the result of a query as if it was a table. And views in SQL are basically used for query simplification, security, aggregate data or if there are complex joins involved where a view can encapsulate the complexity making it easier to users to work with. Now coming to the fifth question. How do you handle null values in SQL? In SQL null value represents the absence of a value in a column. So to handle null values we should check if a column has a null value. We can use the is null or is not null condition in a where clause or we can use functions like colis, if null, is null or the null if function. Now let us see our next question. What is window function in SQL? So a window function in SQL basically performs calculations across a set of table rows that are related to the current row and it allows for more complex queries and provides additional analytical capabilities such as ranking, partitioning and cumulative aggregations. And this window function helps us enhance data analysis and reporting in SQL queries also. Now let us move to our next type of questions where we will see questions based on data analytics. So our first question here is what is the role of KPI or key performance indicator in business analysis and how do you determine it. So key performance indicators or KPIs are like the sign points that help us track how well a business is doing and they are important because they show us if we are moving in the right direction or if there is a room for improvement. And to determine KPIs, we usually start by understanding the business goals. Then figure out what specific measurements will tell us if we are meeting those goals. Now moving on to our second question. The question is, 
describe the process of data cleansing and its significance in BI or business intelligence. So talking about the process of data cleaning, it involves identifying and fixing errors or inconsistencies in the data. And this includes dealing with missing values, correcting typos, standardizing formats and removing duplicates. And in business analytics, where we heavily rely on data to analyze trends and make predictions, having a accurate and clean data is key to getting the right answers. Moving on to our third question, which says, explain the concept of data granularity and its role in analysis. So data granularity is like the level of detail or the size of the puzzle pieces when you are working with the data. And it refers to how finely or closely data is defined or represented. And talking about the role of data granularity in analysis is crucial because it chooses the right level of detail depends on what you are trying to find out. And if you need a big picture overview, coarse granularity might be enough. But if you want to spot small trends or understand a specific patterns, you will need fine granularity. You will need fine granularity. Now moving on to our fourth question, discuss the benefits and challenges of real-time data visualization. So if you talk about the benefits, immediate insights like this allows for quick decision making based on most current information and proactive problem solving like real-time visualization enables like real-time visualization enables early detection of any issue if like real-time visualization enables early detection of any issue if it is there and if we talk about the challenges data quality and accuracy so maintaining data quality in real time can be a very challenging one and second one is infrastructure and cost so implementing real-time data systems requires a robust infrastructure and it can be costly to set up and maintain now let's see our fifth question how do you identify and address data quality issues in a BI project or a business intelligent project. So coming to the identifying part, data profiling basically examines the data to understand its structure, patterns and anomalies. And data validation, if we're talking about the identifying part, data profiling basically examines the data to understand its structure, patterns and anomalies. Data validation implement checks to ensure that data conforms to predefined rules. It also includes validating formats, ranges and relationship between different data elements. If we talk about the identify data quality issues, data profiling examines the data to understand its structure, patterns and anomalies. And data validation implement checks to ensure that data conforms to predefined rules. It also helps, it also includes validating formats ranges and relationships between different data elements and if we talk about addressing those data quality issues standardizing is the one where it includes consistent data formats units of measurement and naming conventions second is data cleansing so by using the data cleansing technique we basically correct errors fill in the missing values and remove the duplicate values now moving on to our sixth question Discuss the role of a decision tree in predictive analysis. Okay, so a decision tree is basically a predictive model tool that visually represents decisions and their possible outcomes. Discuss the role of a decision tree in predictive analysis. So a decision tree is basically a predictive modeling tool that visually represents decisions and their possible outcomes. And it recursively splits data based on features to create a tree-like structure. And it is generally used for classification and regression tasks, helping to analyze complex decision scenarios and predict outcome based on the input variables. Now moving to our seventh question, explain the concept of data profiling and its importance in BI project. So data profiling is like the investigation and understanding the characteristics of data to ensure its quality accuracy and relevance and in the context of business intelligent projects it's vital for discovering patterns assessing data quality identifying anomalies and ensuring accurate insights 
and ultimate supporting informed decision making and ensuring accurate insight ultimately supporting informed decision making now let us see our next type of questions that is data warehousing so our first question is explain the concept of data warehousing and its relevance to business analytics so data warehousing is basically the process of collecting organizing and storing large amounts of data and storing large amounts of structured data from multiple sources to support business decision making and in business analytics it provides a unified and historical view of data enabling efficient analysis reporting and decision making across the organizations now moving to our second question how do you ensure the security and integrity of data in a business intelligence system so to ensuring the security and integrity of data in a business intelligence system is essential to maintain trust in the accuracy and confidentiality of information we implement role based access controls encryption and secure authentication regularly audit and monitoring access and for integrity we use data validation rules which enforce differential integrity and conduct regular data quality checks now moving on to our third question what are the key components of a business intelligence architecture and how do they interact so talking about the components as you can see in this figure also we include data sources etl processes data warehouse business intelligence server and a user interface so data flows from data sources through etl process to a warehouse and business intelligence server processes queries generating insights and then present it to the user interface for the analysis now moving on to our fourth question describe the process of extracting transforming and loading etl data for business intelligence in extraction process we basically retrieves and verifies data from various sources and in transformation we basically process and organize the extracted data and coming to the loading part here we move the transformed data to a data repository and in loading we basically move the transformed data to a data repository now let's move to our fifth question how would you approach data quality validation before implementing a business intelligence solution so ensuring data quality is crucial before implementing any business intelligence solution to guarantee the accuracy and reliability of insights derived from the data so to do that we perform data profiling to access completeness accuracy consistency and timeliness and for that we implement validation rules address anomalies through cleansing and establish data governance practices for regular monitoring and refine for our sustained quality now let's move to our sixth question how do you handle slowly changing dimensions or scd in data warehouse for historical reporting so there are basically three types to handle the slowly changing dimensions type 1 is overwrite so in this approach the existing dimension record is simply overwritten with the new values and update the existing record with new values without preserving the historical versions and talking about type 2 add new row here when a change occurs a new row is added to the dimension table with the updated values and the existing record is usually marked as inactive or expired now talking about the type 3 add columns in this approach some attributes have multiple columns to track changes and with each column representing a different versions of the attribute now let us see our next type of questions that is bi tools here we will look into the questions that were based on power bi and tableau so our first question is describe the steps to create a calculated column in power bi so here are the following steps to create a calculated column in a power bi so our first step is to open power bi desktop and open the data view then we should select the table for which we want to create the calculated column and in third step we will click on modeling in the ribbon and in fourth step we have to choose new column and then enter a formula using dax or data analysis expressions language and at last press enter to create the calculated column and that's how you create a calculated column in power bi
Now moving on to our second question. What is the difference between a Power BI report and a Power BI dashboard? So here we will look into the difference. So here as you can see this table Power BI report basically focuses on data analysis and exploration whereas Power BI dashboard focuses on aggregated view of the key matrices. Talking about design complexities, Power BI report may involve complex data modeling and Power BI dashboard. On the other side, Power BI dashboard makes simpler design and prioritizes accessibility. Talking about sharing and collaboration, Power BI report primarily focuses for detailed analysis sharing, whereas Power BI dashboard makes effective for sharing high level insight. And if we talk about the integration, Power BI report emphasizes data relationships and modeling. On the other side, Power BI dashboards integrates visuals from multiple reports. So that is the basic difference between Power BI report and a dashboard. Now let us see our third question. Explain the concept of self-service BI or self-service business intelligence and how does it benefit organizations. So talking about self-service business intelligence, it basically refers to the empowerment of business users to create, access and analyze data without extensive involvement from IT or data export. And talking about the benefits, it includes faster insights, reduced, depend reduced dependency on IT, improved agility and increased user engagement, enabling individuals across the organizations to make data-driven decisions. Now let us look on to our fourth question. How do you handle large data sets in Power BI for optimal performance. So here are some ways to handle large data sets in Power BI for optimal performance. We can use Power Query Editor to filter and shape data before loading. Second, we can optimize data model by removing unnecessary columns and creating relationships between them. We can implement data compression techniques. Third, we can implement data compression techniques. Fourth, we should consider data summarization using aggregates. And fifth is we can utilize performance monitoring tools for optimization. Now let's move to our fifth question. What are the advantages of using Tableau Prep for data preparation? So here are some of the advantages of using Tableau Prep for data preparation. The first advantage is user friendly interface for intuitive data cleaning and data shaping. Second advantage is visual and interactive data profiling. Third advantage is automate it automates repetitive tasks with smart features. And coming to fourth advantage, it enhances data quality and accelerates the preparation process. Now let's move on to our sixth question. Discuss the role of star schema in optimizing query performance for BI reporting. So here are the role of star schema in optimizing query performance for business intelligence. First one is centralized fact, centralized fact table surrounded by dimension table. Second one is it reduces data redundancy. Second one is it reduces data redundancy and improves data integrity. Third one is it enables efficiency query. Third one is it enables efficient query performance due to simplified join. And fourth one is optimized aggregations and it enhances its optimized aggregations and enhances report retrieval speed. Talking about the fifth one, it facilitates easy navigation and enhances overall BI reporting efficiency. Now let's see our seventh question. Explain the concept of data blending in Tableau and when it is necessary. Data blending in Tableau is basically a technique that is used to combine data from multiple data sources or tables within a single Tableau workspace. And it is necessary when we are combining data from different sources or if primary data source lacks the necessary fields or to enrich insights by blending diverse data sets. Now let us see our next type of questions which were based on important business analysis charts. First question is how do you choose the appropriate chart type for different types of data? So choosing the appropriate chart type for different types of data is essential for effective data visualization and the right chart can convey the information clearly, highly trends, highlight trends and make insights more accessible to the audience. Like you can see this chart on my right, like you can see this chart on my right. For continuous and discrete data type, we generally use line chart. And for discrete data type, for discrete data type, we use bar chart. For continuous data type, we use 
scatter chart for data types where we show the relationship between three variables identifying the trends we use bubble chart there and if the data type is distribution and and if the data type is of distribution analysis we use histogram there if the data type is of density or distribution of data then there we use heat map chart and if there are data types of project management scheduling or task duration then there we use gantt chart so according to different types we use different different types of chart so that we can see the information see the information clearly highlight the trends and make insights more accessible to the audience now moving on to our second question discuss the advantages and disadvantages of using waterfall chart so first let us see the advantages part so the first advantage is it clearly illustrates the cumulative impact of sequential of sequentially introduced positive and negative values second advantage is it is effective for visualizing financial data budget breakdowns and process flows third advantage is it enhances understanding of changes in data over a series of steps and fourth advantage is it encourages a focus on trends and the flow of data helping to identify trends or patterns now let us see the disadvantage part now if we see the disadvantage part the first disadvantage is waterfall charts are not suitable for representing continuous data they are more effective for discrete types of data points second disadvantage is this may be complex for simple data sets or when trends are straight forward if we talk about the third disadvantage it is limited application to specific scenarios like financial reporting and if we talk about the fourth disadvantage point it is potential for misinterpretation if not used appropriately or without context and moving on to a third question can you explain the concept of pareto chart and when it is useful on the right side you can see how pareto chart actually looks repeat and pareto chart basically combines bar and line graphs showing individual values in decreasing order and cumulative percentage through a line it is useful for identifying the most significant factors contributing to a problem focusing on efforts addressing to the most impactful addressing the most impactful issues first and this is commonly applied in quality control process improvement and decision making to prioritize actions based on the principle that a small number of factors contribute to the majority part now moving on to our fourth question what is the difference between data analyst and business analyst so data analyst basically applies statistical and mathematical models to uncover the patterns trends and correlations in data whereas business analyst maps out business processes and identifies areas for improvement and data analyst basically focuses on data and analytics part whereas business analyst focuses on business process and data analyst use tools and technologies like sql excel python r or w whereas business analyst use tools and technologies such as ppmn uml model jira excel and powerpoint so this is the so this is the basic difference between data analyst and business analyst okay our next question is explain uml and its use cases so uml is basically defined as unified modeling language and it is a general purpose development modeling language that provides a standard way to visualize systems and it is basically used to detect and eliminate errors reason for the system behavior and third propose business propose design plans to stakeholders now let us see some scenario based questions So the first question is how would you conduct a b testing to assess the impact of a website change on user engagement so here we should imagine the scenario that we have provided with and based on that scenario we have to provide a proper solution and conducting a b testing to assess the impact of a website change on users engagement involves a structured and controlled approach so the first step would be to define the objective then we select a specific element on the website to test such as call to action button headline image or layout then we will develop two versions of the web page the control which is the original version and the variant version with some proposed changes then fourth step would be to use a random assignment method to ensure that visitors are randomly directed to either control or variant versions of the page then we set up 
tracking tools such as Google Analytics or other AP testing platforms to monitor user interactions with both versions of the page. Then sixth step is to run the AB test for sufficient duration to gather some statistical significant data. Then we use statistical analysis to determine if the observed difference between the control and variant versions are statistically significant. And in the next step, we will analyze the results to understand the impact of the website change on user engagement. And then based on the analysis, we conclude the effectiveness of the website change. And after that, we implement the successful variation if the A-B test indicates positive results. And then finally, we document the A-B testing process, including objectives, variations tested, and results. And the last step would be to adopt a mindset of continuous improvement and learning from A-B testing. And by following these steps, organizations can conclude A-B testing in a systematic manner, enabling data-driven decision-making and the continuous improvement of their website for better user engagement. Now, let's move to our second question. The company is planning to launch a new product. How would you use market trends and historical data to forecast potential demand and optimize the product launch strategy. So launching a new product involves a thorough analysis of market trends and historical data. So firstly, we start by closely examining the current market trends, understanding what customers are currently looking for in the market. Then we dive into historical data related to similar products launches, analyze their past success and failures. Then third step is to review customer feedback from past launches consider both positive and negative reviews to understand customer sentiments. Fourth step is to develop a demand forecast model based on the insights that we gathered. Fifth step, we would recommend a phased approach to product launch, like testing the product in specific markets or demographics before a full scale launch. Sixth step is to work closely with cross-functional is to work closely with cross-functional teams including marketing, sales and product development. And last step is to continuously monitor sales performance and customer feedback after the launch. And by following these steps, we can develop a comprehensive and data-driven strategy that maximizes the chances of a successful product launch. Now let's move to our next question. The organization is looking to reduce operational cost. How would you approach analyzing the current cost structure, identifying areas for optimization and implementing cost saving measures. So reducing operational cost also involves a systematic approach to analyzing the current cost structure, identifying areas for optimization and implementing effective cost saving measures. So we begin with conducting a thorough analysis of current cost structure, categorize cost into fixed and variable expenses. Then we benchmark our current cost against industry standards and best practices, compare the organization's cost structure with similar companies in the industry. Third step would be we collaborate with different departments and teams to gain insights into specific cost drivers. Fourth step is to explore opportunities to leverage technology for cost optimization. Identify other software solutions or automation tools that can streamline processes and reduce manual efforts. Next, we review existing vendor contracts and negotiate for better terms. Then we evaluate current operational process for efficiency and create process improvement initiatives to enhance productivity and reduce cost. Seventh step is to involve employees in cost saving initiatives by providing training programs to enhance skills and improve productivity. And the last step is to implement key performance indicators or KPIs to monitor the effectiveness of cost saving measures. And by following these steps, the organization can systematically analyze its cost structure, identify areas for optimization, and implement practical measures to achieve significant operational cost reductions. Now let's see our fourth question. The company is experiencing a decline in sales. How would you approach this issue using data analytics to identify the root cause and propose a solution for that. Now let's see a proper step-by-step -step approach for this also. So we begin with collecting relevant data on sales performance. Then we clean and validate the collected data to ensure the accuracy. After that, we analyze historical sales data to identify patterns and trends. And then 
we segment customers based on various categories such as demographics, buying behavior or location. We evaluate the performance of individual products or product categories. We identify which products are contributing to decline in the sales and which one are still performing well. Then we analyze the broader market trends and competitor activities and identify any external factors influencing the decline in the sale. Then we collect a feedback from customers through surveys or direct communication. Then we use predictive analysis to forecast future sales trends. We also identify potential challenges or opportunities that may impact sales in the upcoming periods. Step number nine is to analyze the combined insights from historical data, customer segmentation, product performance, market analysis, and customer feedback to identify the root cause of the decline in the sales. Then propose targeted solutions based on the identified root cause. And after that, we implement the proposed solution in a phased wise manner. And in the last step, based on the ongoing data analytics and feedback, iterate and refine strategies. And by following these steps, the organization can leverage data analytics to gain actionable insights into the decline in the sales and also identifying underlying causes and develop effective strategies to reverse this trend. Now let's move on to our next question. The company wants to better understand its customer base for targeted marketing efforts. How would you utilize analytics to segment customers and tailor marketing strategies to each segment? So to better understand the customer base and tailor marketing strategies to each segment, leveraging analytics is crucial. So here is a step-by-step -step approach. We start with collecting relevant data on customer demographics, purchasing behavior, preferences and interactions. Then we utilize analytics tool to segment customers based on common characteristics. Third step, we will develop a detailed profiles for each customer segment. Then we use predictive analytics to forecast future customer behavior within each segment. Step five, here we tailor marketing strategies for each identified segment. And sixth step, here we implement A-B testing for marketing campaigns within each segment. And after that, we implement marketing automation tools to streamline personalized communication. Step number eight, we regularly monitor the performance of marketing strategies using analytics. And after that, we establish a feedback loop by collecting customer feedback. And at last, we ensure alignment between marketing efforts and sales customer service. We share customer insights with other departments to enhance the overall customer experience. And by systematically following these steps, the company can leverage analytics to gain a deep understanding of its customer base, create targeted segments, and implement personalized marketing strategies that resonate with each group. Now let's move on to our sixth question. The company's website is not performing well in terms of user engagement. How would you use analytics to identify areas? So for improving website performance and user engagement through analytics, it involves a strategic and data-driven approach. So let's see our step-by-step -step approach. We start with clearly defining key performance indicators or KPIs related to user engagement, such as bounce rate, time on site, and conversion rates. Then we map out the user journey on the website from entry to conversion. Step number three, we utilize analytics tools to analyze user behavior in real time, like identify popular pages, entry points, and exit points. Step number four, we examine the conversion funnel to identify potential drop-off points. Step number five, we use heat maps and session recording tools to visually understand user interactions and identify areas of high and low engagement on this. Step number six is to analyze the website's performance on different devices, especially on mobile. Step number seven, we implement A-B testing for different elements on the website. And in next step, we use analyticals tool to access page load times, identify and optimize elements that contribute to slow loading. Step number nine, we implement user feedback mechanisms such as surveys, feedback forms, or usability testing. And in step number 10, we analyze 
competitors' websites to identify best practices and areas for improvement. And last step is to implement changes based on insights gained from analytics. Continuously monitor the impact of changes on user engagement metrics. By systematically following these steps, the company can leverage analytics to identify areas for improvement, optimize the user experience, and ultimately enhance user engagement on the website. So that's all we have for this video. If you liked it, give it a thumbs up and share it with your fellow mates. Also, make sure you subscribe to our IntelliPad YouTube channel for regular updates like this. Thank you so much. Just a quick info guys. IntelliPad provides PG certification in business analysis and product management by ENICT Academy MNIT Jaipur. The course link of which is given in the description below. Now, let's continue with the session.